Good afternoon, uh, Jerry Lecture, the first one of 2024. And it's really, really my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Terry Kedwa. Uh, I cannot call you Dr. Kedwa, it's just special. So, uh, and that's like every time I start typing an email, my uh, mailbox actually auto populates Terry Kedwa because that's <laughs> the number of emails I send you every day. Uh, let's do you. But I don't know. <laughs> okay. go, go to Kelly because he's a student. We have a large number of students. So, um, but so Kelly has been such a wonderful partner in crime for the last three years. And uh, this is one good thing about being chair. On a few good things that uh, you get to know faculty that you normally do not collaborate with. They will be in a very different role. And so it has been wonderful to be able to work with Kelly and you. And, uh, you saw my email that uh, I really am very fortunate to have Kelly in the department and I've seen her rise through the ranks and through the tracks in a spectacular way. So it's a true start. Uh, following the tradition of journey lectures, where we have uh, two of Kelly's graduate students in the honor of formal introduction. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce you to the host of this afternoon's journey lecture. Uh, Mari Wang and Sarah Mendy. Please give them a big round of applause. So, uh, Mari is going to introduce Kelly, and then at the end, we're going to present the certificate and the box of chocolates, the tradition as well. So, it's really a wonderful afternoon celebrating a member of our community that we all truly are. So, Mari, it's over to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Kelly Kipple, uh, an invaluable member of our biotech department and a mentor to many, including myself. Uh, Dr. Kipple earned her doctoral degree in biostatistics from the University of Pittsburgh and has since become a leading expert in the design and analysis of trials, particularly sequential multiple time trials. Her work extends, extends across various fields including mental health, chronic pain, substance use, and ontology. She collaborates with researchers across our university and others. Her research is supported by grants from prestigious organizations such as the FDA and Corey, and it earned her recognition, um, including the inaugural John Paul Award. In addition to her research, Dr. Kidwell is a dedicated mentor, advisor, and educator supporting numerous students within our department. In her role as Associate Chair for Academic Affairs, she extends her support not only to her own historical biostats community. I feel privileged to call her my PhD advisor. Uh, her unwavering support for her students, both academically and personally, is truly admirable. And whether it's offering guidance on our research or just brightening up our meetings by always bringing chocolate, every week she brings chocolate to our meeting. <laughs> Seriously, every week, a whole thing of chocolate. Uh, and just providing invaluable advice when it comes to career or uh, future uh, education, uh, she really goes above and beyond. She ensures that her students never feel alone, and uh, she really excels not only as a researcher, but as a mentor and a caring individual. So I'm excited to learn about her journey today, along with everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I did lose my voice a little bit at now, but um, I think with the mic, it's going to be okay. So if you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, it's all worth it already. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Lamar. Uh, very sweet. So I'm going to talk about my journey, and it feels a little weird for me to talk about this for an hour, um, but hopefully this will all uh, be fun. So first, Lamar asked me to give a journey lecture, and I was like, what? I <laughs> How did I talk about my journey? It doesn't really seem like I'm supposed to do that. Um, and I, so I was a little <laughs> And then I realized that actually this was a, a huge And I was so grateful uh, to be asked. And, and when I thought about it, I was like, you know what? I actually, I feel like I play a lot of roles. I have a lot of things in my hands. I juggle a lot, of, a lot of different roles. And it'd be nice to chat about them with students that may or may not. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, 
<laughs> and I'm going to explain to you that food in a second. So first, let me tell you where I've lived. So I say I'm from Baltimore, um, and I kind of am. So I actually was born in Annapolis, uh, which is over here. And I lived there for the first year of my life. And then when I was one, my parents moved to this small town called Baltimore, which is northeast of Baltimore. Uh, my parents actually lived, or they, they worked in Baltimore. They worked at Johns Hopkins. Um, my dad worked at Towson for a little while. And I went to school, high school and middle school in Towson, which is a bigger town near Baltimore. So, so I'll say I'm from Baltimore, and then they'll be like, oh, where? And they'll be like, Towson. Really? And then maybe I'll say that. Um, but so I, I lived in the Baltimore area. I also had a lot of family in D.C., and I went there for a summer program. Um, and then I went to Lewisburg college, Pittsburgh for grad school, oh, I spent a semester abroad in Dublin in college, um, and then here in Maryland. So you would expect, given that I'm a Marylander, uh, some crab. And I would love to give you hard shells, or to give you crab cakes and soft shells. Grow up, I grew up feasting on these things. I love crab. Um, however, all the crab cakes in Ann Arbor are <laughs> I cannot just, I just could not pick one to give to you. I will not eat crab outside of Baltimore. I don't think it's worth it. Um, and so to ship like crab cake here, we're just spending the entire budget. Um, so instead, uh, what you got was uh, my favorite granola. I have a slight obsession with cereal and bread. And this one comes from Baltimore. It's really close to where I live, actually. And I uh, first got it at the farmer's market in Baltimore. And now you can find it in your local home. It's called Michelle's Granola. This is my favorite because I like chocolate. It's hard chocolate. It's chip chocolate. Uh, so that's what you're having. And then it, some of you who came early got the yogurt. Uh, sorry, <laughs> that, went, that went quickly. Um, that, uh, that I have that yogurt. Um, so that's why we got that with it and some berries. And then I thought there was going to be tea, but I don't think there was. Um, oh, there was? Oh, okay. Sorry. So yeah. Oh, I should have gotten my sauce. So there's also this Fraser tea, which is actually a Michigan based company. Um, and my favorite tea is Earl Grey cream tea. I drink it every morning. I don't drink coffee. Um, I'm a tea drinker, a tea lover, and this is my passion. And I don't have anything against coffee. I just love coffee. Um, okay, so I'll take you the, at the st very start before my journey and talk about a little bit about my um, So this is my mom and my dad, uh, Rick and Candy. And um, on this side, my dad's family. So my dad's one of five. Um, this is him and his, his siblings and his parents. Um, and this is taken after the wedding. Uh, and then this is my mom. She's one of four. Um, and this is her her family, uh, obviously, before I was born. Um, and my parents actually grew up around the same area and even went to the same elementary school. So their families were, were friends. Um, my grandparents, so this is, if you can see sort of here, this is where I get my height. Uh, this is my dad. He's six foot six. Uh, my grandpa six five. Um, my aunts are six feet. My uncle is six three. Um, so this is although my mom will remind me that her dad is a but mostly this is the kid ball. The kid ball genes are strong here. So my grandpa, um, I called him Papa. His name was Richard Dick Kidwell. Um, he was in the army and then he worked for the Department of Justice and he actually worked for Bobby Kennedy. So this is my grandpa, Bobby Kennedy. Um, he was like his right hand man for, for some time. He had some really cool stories about that. Uh, he was 6'5, he was a baseball player, um, and just an all around spectacular saint. Uh, he died a sickle. Um, he, he was around for uh, all of my childhood. That's just, just such a wonderful person. Um, my grandmother, she, her name was Maureen, but everybody called her Dean. Um, however, when I was born, they were like, well, this is Dini, and I couldn't say Dini, it's like Meanie. So then she got renamed Meanie, and every child called her Meanie. Um, and she was just so fun. And so her parents were Irish, um, and she had the most spectacular Irish she could uh, tell all these stories in. And you could do no wrong with Meanie as a grandchild, at least. Um, and so we'd go over to her house and like, mess up everything, and she would, you know, it's still something. Like, oh, just water molecules uh, like if somebody got in an accident just metal molecules like it just didn't it didn't, it just didn't phase her She's like at least you're okay and that was just like such a wonderful thing to have with your mother. um and then my my mom's parents were harold and lucille kelly so this is how i got my name uh it was my mom's maiden name my brother's that extra in there that everyone gets out 
Um, <laughs> so uh, my my mom's dad, I he died before I was born. Um, but he was in World War II, and then on the Vetsville, went to Johns Hopkins University, played lacrosse, and got his degree in engineering, and started his own. Uh, my grandmother was actually orphaned. Um, her parents in Chicago drove over a, a trail bridge and uh, died when she was quite young, so she and her sisters were orphaned, um, and she was taken care of by some family. And otherwise, she actually went into the war as well, and she was a World War II field personality. She met Orson Welles this way. She wrote her love letters, uh, fell in love with her. However, unfortunately, they don't exist anymore because my grandfather burned them. <laughs> <laughs> it's only a tale that we tell to the, the family. Um, but so, so this is my, these are my mom's parents. She's older. She actually lived with us from when I was two to 16. Um, so we built an addition onto our house. So she had her own apartment. She was just a, a huge influence every day. She was very artsy and crafty. And I was not, but she was so sweet and patient with me in trying to do all the things that she did. Um, so my parents, as I said, they went to the same elementary school. Um, this is their amazing 70s wedding attire. Uh, their families were friends, although they didn't start dating until they were in college. Uh, my mom, her name is Candy or Candace. Uh, she was a high school teacher originally out of college, um, and then she went into school administration. She was like in my middle school, and then she went to a different high school, and then she started. She was a co coordinator of the kids back to med program at Johns Hopkins University, um, and she would do anything for uh, for me and for my kids. She's so generous. She would give me her arm. She absolutely lives for my kids. She buys things far too much for them, um, but it's it's really cute to see. Uh, how much she she loved her. Uh, my dad, Rick, um, he uh, was a basketball star um, in, in college and got an NCAA scholarship to law school uh, after that as well. Um, so he went into private practice. Um, and then he went in-house to, to do law at uh, Boston University and then um, Portland. Um, growing up, I wanted to be I just thought he was the coolest person. He was so wonderful. Um, it was actually great in terms of like he was tall. I wanted to be him. I love being tall. Right. So like I was never that girl that was hunched over. I was always like, I'm too um, Like I just wanted to do all the things that I did. Um, he is a wonderful person, and um, I just I I lived a lot of my life trying to be him, and I realized at some point like, oh, I'm. Um, but it was a good person. Uh, he, he actually pioneered medical malpractice mediation um, at Johns Hopkins and then was recruited to fix it to do that. He's been written up in several of, of books. Uh, Henrietta Lack's book, actually, my dad is in. Um, and, and so he had a really great career. He just retired. So today is his 70th birthday. Uh, so it's kind of neat. So here's our late 1980s photo where my dad and his, is in his Tom Selleck era, if you know him, who that is. Uh, my brother and I are dressed as if we're like royalty or something. <laughs> and, and you'll notice I have a brother. Um, so most people think I'm the only child, but I actually have an older brother. He's three and a half years older than me. Um, he is started off as this like cute, you know, innocent little blonde kid. And then um, as you can see, <laughs> Got funny. Um, so, so my brother and I are like not alike at um, And when I hear most people say that their sibling is different, and then I explain my brother, they're like, "Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're not that different." Um, so, so my brother, like in, in high school, he, he's my brother's super smart. Um, he's he's really smart. He's really talented with words. He is also an artist. So. He started playing instruments, he was in bands, then he started making his own music. This QR code is famous. Uh, his music name is Sex, C E X. Uh, this is a list of his album titles, which I cannot say aloud, but you are welcome to. <laughs> um, he, he was actually written up in the 2003 Rolling Stones. So he, he went to Johns Hopkins, he dropped out to go on tour with Death Cab and Pixel Service. Um, if you know those bands, so he was actually doing quite well 
And then he just really doesn't want to do things that people want to hear. <laughs> so he's like, I don't want to keep making that music. I want to do something different. I want to experiment. And people are like, Oh so he he's still he still plays music he still makes music he lives in Baltimore I just saw him um he, this is him uh, actually just a few months ago so he's all tatted up uh, he lost all of his hair but he used to do these really cool things with his hair growing up like he gave himself a comb over when he was a teenager and like he grew out his beard you can kind of see he was like, shaved in the middle um, <laughs> just like really different things um and I'm so grateful for my brother in my life because. Otherwise, as you'll see, I grew up in a really like homogeneous environment and uh, relatively conservative for some of that time. But my brother really exposed me to lots of different thoughts and ways, and um, really made me appreciate so much more than I think I would have if I didn't. Um, and because that there's not a lot of math or stat in this, this lecture, sadly, uh, I added some uh, sad math. To it. So uh, my brother, right, is like. Like, my family's kind of here, and my brother's one of those outliers. Uh, a little bit there, we're, we're pretty different, but um, he's wonderful. I'm grateful for him. I saw him another day. Uh, he's living in Baltimore, marching to the beat of his own drum uh, these days. So, so growing up, so I grew up in Baldwin. Uh, this is our house. Like I said, this part was my grandma's. We had that part in this is her house. It was connected to the door in the basement. Um, and then uh, this part was a garage. But we had like three and a half acres. Uh, this is my adorable little girl, K Casey, which is like a kid well um, <laughs> And had like a really fortunate, blessed, you know, really great upbringing. Um, this is my award winning little Bo Peep costume <laughs> that my grandma made for me. As I said, she had been a um, I won that in some like local public award and like, started this starting rebellion. <laughs> uh, I dabbled in, in like all of the things, so I tried out dance for a little bit, and I appreciate that. I think it gave me some information, which is the world I didn't have as a tall person. Um, I grew up Catholic, so we went to, to church every Sunday. This is my first communion uh, picture. And then I also have this like, amazing dance in you know, every picture in the early 90s. Um, and I, I tried out all the so I played soccer for a few years, but what I really found is that I loved basketball. Again, I wanted to be my dad. Um, basketball was just like fun. I loved it. And that's a lot of what my children are. Um, also, my extended family. So my dad, you know, was five, it, his one of, he was one of five, his four siblings and parents, his mom and four of her siblings and parents, they're all within an hour and a half radius uh, to us. And so we had all the family functions growing up um so there are just so many family gatherings it's just a big family get together with all the cousins and aunts and uncles all the time that was just really wonderful um like i said i played a lot of sports i had a few health issues um growing up so when i was one i had a federal seizure um and they did a lot of tests to figure out what was wrong with me and eventually figured out i had something called influx of the kidneys um and so this is something that children can have and generally grow out of. And so I was monitored biannually to always test on from when I was one to when I was ten. Uh so I finally had two surgeries in it. So I unfortunately didn't grow out of it. Um but after two surgeries it was corrected. It was a little bit of a uh something that, you know, was a little different in my childhood, but it wasn't it wasn't a horrific thing. It gave me kidney infection. Um, but mostly it was it was manageable. I also had a virus in my eye, and so that happened first when I was three, and I had to stay in the dark for a few months and get these eye drops that actually scarred my eye. Um, but it, it, then they realized better how to take care of it. It reoccurred when I was 13 and 23, but I managed to not get it at um, as they figured out some preventative medicine. Hopefully that didn't happen. Um, and so here's in my childhood in elementary school uh, where I remember my first memory of enjoying and I don't know if anyone else had this, but we had in our school, we had something called magnets. Anyone else heard of this? Yeah. Okay. So we had these magnets, right? They started in like second grade or something. They were addition, subtraction, and then they went to multiplication and division. And they're this like worksheet like this that you get out, and you had one minute to complete as many as possible. This was the best thing ever. I just look forward to this so much. It was like sport competition plus math together. And I'd get this paper and I'd be like, 
Done. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like so much fun. So that that's my first memory of. Okay, I usually never share these photos because I'm <laughs> horrifically embarrassed of my middle school. But my mom sent me this, and so you get to see. I'm feeling great. I call this my cocooning. Uh, <laughs> sixth through eighth grade. So I went to a public elementary school, and then my brother went to the public middle school, and he told my parents that it was not. Um, and so my parents then decided that they were going to look around all the private schools in Walmart, um, Walmart area. This is quite common that people go to private schools, and public schools are not as good. Um, and so they spent my college tuition on my middle school and high school uh, to go to Notre Dame for part. This is in Towson, Maryland. It's a uh, you know old Catholic institution. Uh, however, there are not that many nuns left, so it's mostly just regular people. Um, but these were my school IDs for sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, uh, where you can see this transformation start to take place. Um, and <clears throat> middle school was was generally great. Again, I had this health issue, so I actually, as you can see me grow up, I grew. I had real growing pains, so I grew way too fast. I was always tall. But in seventh grade, I had this massive growth spurt where I grew a couple inches in like a month. And my nerves could not keep up. And so this perineal, this common perineal nerve actually split. And I couldn't lift my feet up or out to the side for a year. And so this, we figured this out as I was like constantly falling over myself in basketball and just walking. I was just like, one day after basketball, I was trying to get, I was trying to walk to the car and it was raining. Water was going everywhere. Little toe, little toe. And I was like, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> he feels terrible. <laughs> oh, and then the next day, you know, like I was trying to get up the skill to school and I was just like falling. And my parents were like, what's happening? So I went to the emergency room. Uh, they thought I had Pian Beret. It turns out I was the 11th documented case in this thing that I have. Uh, I keep look, searching for my case study and the reports, uh, but I haven't found it. Um, but anyway, so so I just couldn't lift my feet up or out for about a year until the nurse was um, And then everything was fine. But it was just this growth spurt. Um, <clears throat> they, they told me to wear some mountain boots so that I protected my ankles, um, which was quite nice as you see my, I'll show you my school uniform. <laughs> and, um, and otherwise, I just kept doing everything that I was doing. And, and at the end, they thought that was actually really helpful because they thought that I was going to take a chance for it to get better and uh, it was faster. So I emerged, um, not quite as embarrassed as this book. And um, at, so NDP, I went for middle school um, and high school. The middle school was about 50 girls. And then the high school more were admitted, so it was 150. Um, and this was our really funny looking uniform that had this like Peter Pan collar. We had to wear a name tag. Um, we had to wear saddle shoes. So that was the part that was really important. And we had to have white socks that folded it. And if you didn't have the folded over socks, if you didn't have your knee tag, right, you'd get a detention. Or if your skirt was more than two inches above your knee, detention. Luckily, the teachers took pity on me during the road skirt, as I could not keep up with letting them out. <laughs> um, but I, I generally actually absolutely love it. It was wonderful to never think about what I was wearing. I just put that on, go to school. It was it was great. I was really sad at college. Too old. Um, I also think that having all girls for me, um, there's, so actually, uh, there's some research that says, you know, this isn't necessarily good for anyone, um, some of it by my mother-in-law, um, <laughs> but, uh, it was, I think it was really good for me to not worry about any distraction in, in class, um, and to just focus on, on school. I also had some really good math teachers. Um, some of the cons, though, were that, <clears throat> so this is a very homogeneous. These are almost all, you know, middle to upper class, white girls, almost all pack. There's very little diversity. Um, and quite honestly, there are a lot of cult-like things. In um, <laughs> and looking back, I'm like, wow. Um, so these are not, and I'm not in these photos, but these are two activities that we did that I find that when I tell people. So in eighth grade, we had a synchronized swim show. That we had to be a part. We had to create teams, choreograph our own synchronized routine and performance. 
Um, and I was horrible at this. So that this, we had something like this where like all my friends and I were in this circle and you're supposed to do this like dolphin flip and come back in the circle and all my friends were in the circle and I was like, yes. <laughs> And I was coming back. I, was like, I, I played basketball, that's him. Um, and then we had this thing called Jimmy's, which is, uh, oh, so this is our Jimmy uniform, by the way. It's called a tunic. So we had a blue tunic and a white blouse and bloomers underneath, um, which was our gym uniform, and you had to wear white sneakers. Um, so, so we had this thing called Jimmy in high school, where every year you and your class competed in march, song, dance, and aerobics in poster. And you chose a um, theme for, for your class or year, and then everything had to do with that. And there were little committees that like, made the costumes for dance, and that came up with the aerobics routine, you chose the song. And then, like, all the girls, you had to choose between dance and aerobics, and you did all the other things. Um, and you had to compete in this, and then, like, people were super competitive. But guess what? Every year, the seniors won. <laughs> so, like, it was just like, why are we doing this? Um, and I actually found a video from like my senior year, but the themes were so politically incorrect that I could not share. So <laughs> it was just a very interesting, interesting experience and things that we did. But really, mostly I look back very fondly over this year. I had the most fantastic teacher. This is again where Matt came into my life. So this is my teacher, Mrs. Gilbert. We called her Mrs. Ruby. She was my seventh grade math teacher. Um, and she just like, I just had such wonderful interactions with her, and she was kind of the one that was like, "Hey, you're actually you're good." I had no idea. I was like, oh, really? Wow! I didn't I didn't know that. And she said, "Oh, some, I use your test as the answer." Like, what? <laughs> I didn't. Wow! Um, and so she kind of put in my head that like math was something that I could pursue. And then in ninth and eleventh grade, I had Mrs. Fastshaw, um, and she was just like the sweetest woman, and again, super encouraging. This really made me love uh, studying math. Really started the trajectory. Um, I also played a lot of sports in, in middle school and high school. So uh, I played basketball since I was five. In eighth grade, I started playing volleyball. So, like, club team plus school teams. I started playing volleyball in high school. Um, we had some really snazzy sweats, uh, as you can see. Um, I actually started getting recruited for basketball quite early. Um, and I thought that I wanted to do that based on like what you know, my dad's footsteps. Um, and then in like 11th grade, I decided that I didn't want to go and see the like clearing house to do basketball in college. But I didn't want to choose college based on my basketball. Uh, so I didn't do that. Um, I was actually really lucky and I got this like Baltimore district award for um, some hero award um, for being a student athlete my senior year. Um, and I, I just really loved the sport, but I didn't want to make it more serious. So you might think then, that like, oh, you must have had a lot of colleges that you went to. However, actually, I didn't. <laughs> I applied to one college. Um, I was super lazy at the college. I don't remember who Or I don't remember who um, It's so different from what I know everyone's coming to do. But my mom, well, everybody, so people around me were like, oh, you like math? Do you like science? Just do engineering. Um, and then my mom was like, I've heard this school book now is two hours away from us where we live, and it's a good one. And I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> and so we went to visit it, and I was like, this is cool. Um, and so I applied there. I applied early. I got in. That's all I applied to. Um, I went to Bucknell University. This is a small liberal arts school in the uh, middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. It was about two hours drive from where I grew up in Walmart, which seemed like a nice distance away, but still close enough in case something happened. Um, and I first I was in the School of Engineering. What was really neat about Bucknell is that they have a whole first year where you can just like find out about all the different engineering types to figure out which engineering you want to go in. Um, what what I came to the conclusion is I don't like it. <laughs> I like math, um, and so I couldn't choose the type of engineering I wanted to do. So I switched schools um, to the regular like, literature or science and arts school, uh, arts and science school, is most place called, um, and just became an um, and then this is where I remember being first frustrated. So up until this point, I just always loved it. Um, and then all of a sudden, I get my first proof space in class, and my numbers turn to paragraphs. And I'm like, that's not what I signed up for. <laughs> um, and I had this other amazing mentor, female mentor, uh, come to the rescue. Pam Borkin was, uh, was my professor in this class that I was struggling in. And 
to her office hours, and she was just incredibly supportive. Can do this, great, keep going. Um, instead of veering off and not doing something that I'm not going to have to today, um, I stuck with it. I continued with the math. So, so, so grateful. <clears throat> So uh, Bucknell is a liberal arts school, um, and so that means that you have to take classes outside of what you're interested in. However, I like really played that so that I took two English classes, and then all the other arts I took were like accounting and economics, <laughs> and all the ones that were quantitative. Um, so I got a minor in economics, so I got a, a bachelor of science in I took a bunch of stuff. Um, and I, I also, like when I got there, when I got to Bucknell, um, they had actually a JV basketball. Their division one basketball, um, and they had this like 12 JV team. And I started playing because I just wanted to do it for fun. Um, so I started playing that, and then the coaches came to practice and they asked me to be on the varsity. So I played for, for like a month on the varsity Bucknell basketball team, um, and then decided that, you know, actually, I just I don't want to do this for like, two practices a day. The girls were like not super excited to have this girl just walk on. Um, and so I wasn't, I wasn't really feeling it. So I, I went back and I, I had my, my month of college athletics and then went back to JV. Um, but it was really cool. We got to travel a little through basketball. I still got to do what I really enjoyed. Um, my junior year of college, I got to go abroad. Um, and I chose to go to Ireland because I'm not good at other languages. And so it was really nice to go to a place where I could still um, understand and speak the language, but also get a little bit of different culture. Um, so I was there in the winter of 2006. I actually arrived on my 21st birthday, where it doesn't matter that you're 21, um, <laughs> but had a really good time anyway. And um, <laughs> then I was there for St. Patrick's Day um, and, and all of the fun in between. I went to the University College of Dublin. Uh, there's a, a, a school there called Trinity, which is maybe better known. You have to go do the abroad program for a year. Um, so I went to UCD for a semester. Um, this is the Cliffs of Norton, Norway. I got to visit a few places um, when I was abroad. Um, and what I really, this this time ab abroad was really impactful to me because I learned that I actually liked it. It wasn't until I was abroad where you're not forced to learn. Or like, you know, everybody's not, everybody's not going to class. So you actually really do make that choice. Um, and so all of my classmates, there was like a group from the we, were, we didn't know each other before, but we were from America that time. And like none of them went to class. And I, I wanted to go to class. I wanted to access, first of all. And second <laughs> of all, I like really wanted to. Um, and so I, that was really interesting to like figure that out. Whereas before, I just, it was just kind of like routine. You just go. Um, and then I was like, no, I actually like this. I also learned that I love uh, Guinness and Jameson um, on this trip. Um, they have the factories there. It tastes so much better over there. Still be here. Um, I also, I just became much more um, confident in my independence. Not to be by myself, but doing things by myself. Um, it was a, a real growing option. And I also learned that I love coffee, which sounds really silly, but I just walked everywhere. Like I would walk from UCD into the city center, which isn't a short walk. Most people take a bus, but I just walk around the cities. Um, and so when I went to grad school, I got rid of my car so I could just walk around kids. Um, and now I walk to work every day. Um, it's just something that I really enjoy, that sort of lifestyle, using the cards as little as possible. So I came back from Ireland and I, I did a summer program. <clears throat> I call this math camp, uh, but it was really called the Summer Program for Women in Mathematics. Um, this is a, was a long-running uh, NSF-funded summer program. So before there were SIDS, this program existed. Um, it was a little different. It was hosted by George Washington. In DC, so I got to live there for the summer. Um, and it's kind of similar to the program, but uh, we had four didactic courses um, that we were learning that were taught by experts in the field that came to teach these things. Um, and then we had lots of field trips. We got to go to the National Security Agency, we got to go to the Census Bureau, we got to go to NIH, um, and kind of see like, where my is. Um, and this is where I made my decision. So, so I don't know. Um, this is, this is all the other girls in the program. Uh, they actually still like have a meeting for everybody in this group. Joint math meetings. I don't ever go, but, um, I could eventually, you know, people, but this is where I decided, you know, I think I want to go to grad school. 
I knew I didn't want to be like a high school math teacher. I wasn't really sure what the other options were. Um, and it was this course, actually, Mathematical Modeling and Biology, that got me Googling. And then I found biostatistics. That sounds good. Um, so from there, I decided to apply to a bunch of bio sciences. So unlike my one application for college, I actually applied to out of 10 uh, bio sci programs. Um, I, I applied to lots of PhD programs. I, I realized I didn't want to pay for a master's. I thought, yeah, probably a PhD, maybe I yeah, applied like that. Uh, so I applied to a bunch of PhD programs, mostly on the East Coast, because that's where I was from and felt familiar with. Um, my grades were really great. Uh, my letters of recommendation were really great, uh, but I did not study for the GREs or take any type of prep for that, and they were not so great. Like, honestly, I'm not sure English counts as my first language for my GREs. <laughs> so, um, in the math world, like, fine, but like, I was like, geometry? What? Um, so, so not amazing. And so I was accepted to all the master's programs that I applied to, like we do, where we're like, you're not ready. PhD, you can go to our master's program. Um, and only two PhDs. I was accepted to Boston University of Boston. Um, I went and I visited both of them. Um, and I really liked all the opportunities at Pitt, and it just so happened that my parents moved to this college. Um, and so having them close by, I did not like having them close by was really, was really kind of a loss. Um, so I decided to go to the university. And, and I am so grateful. I went there. I know that it is not top of the, uh, the ranking list, but it was a wonderful place for me. I went sort of in like a golden age where Sally Horton was the um, chair of our department. So she's a very well known statistician in now um, at the school in Arizona. Um, and then I met my uh, mentor, Abby Swag, who I am so, so grateful for. He was my teacher. I found him to be challenging, but supportive, so smart, so many. Um, and he did really cool research. So I went to him and I was like, will you be my advisor? And he was like, I've never mentored an American student. <laughs> and he was like, I don't know. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, really? Well, you're great. I'll be great. I promise this will be worth it. Um, and so he did say yes, uh, eventually. But it was interesting. I was his first uh, uh, domestic student, U.S. student that he ever mentored. I hope that I made it. Uh, Good for him. I think so. I just saw him at UNAR. Um, but we had a great relationship. I, I love working with him. I just saw him keep in touch with him. And actually, his wife, uh, Samia, uh, worked at the place where I did my GSRA. Um, and so I worked, my GSRA was at the National Research Project, which is now NRG, and it's a national consortium for uh, large clinical trials. Um, and so I got this intro to clinical trial research um, with my GSRA advisor, Joe Costantino, who is also a wonderful man. Um, and, and both Wahed and uh, Joe Costantino were at my wedding. Um, they were just wonderful, great people to be a part of. Um, and I'm also grateful to pay for all the friends and fun that I have. So um, in Pittsburgh, I had some really awesome friends. So that's Samia, that was Wahed's wife, who I also worked my friend, um, and this is my best friend in the uh, my program, Uma Tazdek, who's a <coughs> um, statistician in New York, and, um, and these were my really great friends that were actually in HBAG and uh, orientation. We had a lot of fun in Pittsburgh. Um, Uma and I both studied and celebrated together um, for all of our, our PhD, you know, stress and fun. Um, and then I found the Pittsburgh Sports League, so I started playing basketball and college ball in Pittsburgh, just continuing my fun and meeting people. Um, and I started doing yoga. So there was this yoga studio. I'd never done yoga before. Power heated, heated power yoga. Class. And I was like, oh, I think I'm going to try something new to like complement the basketball. Maybe I don't want so many bruises anymore. Um, and so I started doing yoga. And it, it was like super hard for me. I'm not a, a necessarily a flexible person, but I just really loved that challenge. Um, and I loved it. And so I, they have this work exchange program. So I worked at the desk and checked people in. Um, and in exchange, I got to do yoga for free because I was a, a poor grad student, right? Um, and so it was here at yoga, at Amazing Yoga, that I actually went to my husband, Luke, who is back there. <laughs> Um, where he kept coming into yoga and he was paying every class. 
And so I was noticing, like, here's this guy paying every class. So I was like, hey, um, you know, it would be uh, better for you if you just bought the 10 pack. Um, and that would save some money. And that, he thought that was flirting. Economically <laughs> <laughs> sensible. <laughs> but, you know, I did notice that he came in every time. And so I'm really glad that he thought I was flirting because that prompted him to ask me. Um, <laughs> and we had... So much great time in Pittsburgh. So um, it was actually really nice that my parents were there. My dad got a lot of tickets um, that Luke and I got to do. So we would go to the football and the baseball and the hockey games, and we have really amazing seats. Um, and here, Luke was a you know rooting for his home team. He did not put on the Steelers JD that day, so uh, we were enemies. Um, but uh, it it was just a lot of fun uh, being in Pittsburgh. It's a really cool city. So let me take a whole slide <laughs> because he is my best friend. And, um, you know, I first noticed him because he's six months. <laughs> Height is important to me. Um, but he is so much more than just a tall man. Uh, he, is, he is just such a wonderful person that he's from Madison, Wisconsin. He did his undergrad at Williams, uh, where he did soccer. True. And, uh, he was at Pittsburgh doing his PhD in psychology with concentration in health science. And it just so happened that we were actually like in the same year of our program. His program was longer. We matched up to like graduate. Um, anyway, going to yoga turned into a lot of conversations. And I just realized just how smart and, and motivated and awesome. Um, so Luke is a, a superstar researcher. He's here faculty in psychology. Um, he has won every Rising Star Award for his degree in psychology and does some really cool research that you can go to his website if you're interested. He studies essentially what I say, kids are bad, uh, but it's a lot more than that. <laughs> um, uh, and hopefully he's going to write a pop psychology book soon and all of you are going to follow. Um, but really, he is he's my biggest supporter, my biggest cheerleader, and it's just like I couldn't, I couldn't ask for for more uh, in, in a partner. So I'm so grateful that I went to pay in so much of that. So uh, we we were ended up graduating at the same time. So we had this two body problem of like, where do we go? Um, we were engaged, we weren't yet married, um, but we knew that we wanted to be together. So we applied all over the place, mostly East Coast and Midwest, um, trying to make it overlapping. He knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a professor at an R1 university. He had this very clear track uh, that he wanted to follow. I had no idea. I was like, well, I don't know, tenure track, non-tenure track, industry. Let me just throw it all out there. Be I don't know. Let me try all of them. So I applied to all these different companies. Um, and uh, we were both really lucky. We had lots of interviews. Um, actually, I think every interview we got, we got that offer. Um, so we had lots of options, which is super exciting, but also made it a little bit stressful to figure out how do we match these up and go to these. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in the end, it was a compromise. And uh, this was actually Luke's best fit, Michigan. Um, and they were able to find something for me as a spousal hire. So I was hired as a spousal hire as a research assistant professor. And it, I felt like for the first few years that I did not believe. I was not sure that I fit in, that I was valued, that what I did was uh, something that people liked here and or that I was smart enough to had super imposter syndrome. Um, but this definitely was the best, best place for work. And I that went away after I'm so, so grateful uh, that we came to Michigan. Obviously, 12 years went from research assistant professor to research associate professor to associate professor to professor. Well, this is sort of like the timeline of what happened from 2012 uh, to, you know, to today. Um, and I was able to sort of get in here to feel somewhat uncomfortable, but to do what I like doing and then to find out that that was valued um, and that I you know, do have a place here. So there are a lot of fun events that happened. I came in, I started teaching right away for a class that doesn't exist anymore. Um, we had our wedding back in Pittsburgh and team. We got our first child, Ellie, uh, Ellie Belly. She's uh, almost 10 years old, our, our black lab mix. 
Um, and then we decided, yes, we kept her alive. We can have a real child. Uh, <laughs> we had our Gracie girl who just turned eight. Um, uh, I got my first uh, Pocori contract, my first kind of like grant, which was very exciting in 2016. Actually, I was I just had Grace. And like within three weeks, I'm on maternity leave. And I get this email from Pocori. We need all of these things in order for you to really get this grant. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so I'm like, so sleep deprived. And I have no idea what's going on, but I'm like, I need this grant. Um, and I got it, and it's totally worth it. Um, I developed the undergrad class, which now Matt teaches far superior to what I had in mind. Um, but that was really fun. And then we had uh, Caleb, who just turned um, And they're not here today because I don't think they find this interesting. But I will hope that they watch it on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so, so going through, um, when I came here, one of the great things about this place and why I decided you know, this was good for both of us to come was that Susan Murphy, who was in the staff department at South Harvard, she was here. Um, and I, you know, she's like the godmother smart of, of what I do. So I was really excited to go to her lab meetings. I got really integrated uh, with her group, Danny and Billy. Uh, they were, you know, they collaborated with me. Uh, there was a lot of connection there immediately, and so I felt like I had something to switch to. Um, I was also in the Cancer Center Biostack group, and um, Bill, Lily, Matt, and I, I felt like had a really nice group going where we could ask each other questions. We were put on the second floor for a while, but we always knew we had each other um, to go back and forth in the in offices, um, so they were really great to, to have around and to feel like I had to. Um, Alex Sotokov asked me to co-chair one of his students' dissertations early on, and this is where I felt like it gave me a lot more confidence. So mentor, doing research, and this is so grateful for Alex for bringing, for bringing me in and doing this work. Um, and then in 2014, Lori Tamura, who was at, used to be at Eli Lilly and then was at University of South Florida, approached me to put forward this program. It's really just sort of launched. Um, and so I'm so grateful for him and his collaboration. And then we brought in Tom Braun to, to work on the Pocori Project uh, with his first student, or one of his students, Roshan, um, which was my first student, um, and that's Roy over there too. <clears throat> um, and for the, our first Pocori Contract, Tom wasn't even getting that hurt. Um, so I was really grateful for him for, for helping us, for giving a student and for working on this with us. Um, and then that's just led to so much more uh, that we've done. And in these pictures, you can see my adorable children, but also you can see some of the amazing students that I've had, um, some of them here, um, but also some of them who have graduated. And I've just had the most spectacular students. So grateful to, to be a mentor to that. So I stole this Franklin D. Roosevelt, who wrote his books. Um, you know, I really have picked some amazing students. I'm so grateful for all the work that we've been um, pushing. Um, and along with all the work, I had this phenomenal thing. So um, my amazing children, Lucy and Caleb, who have just grown up to be this cute, adorable, fun, um, loving children. Um, here's our, our dog. She's now grown up this big Ellie. Um, we also have a cat. Uh, if anybody wants a cat, you're welcome to <laughs> She's very sweet. She's 17. She's very loving. Nobody really loves her though in our family because we have she lives in the basement and we don't see her. So she would love someone to love her. Really, if you want a cat, please love me. She is the love. Her. Um, but like we've had so many fun family adventures. Uh, this is from uh, last summer. We got to go to Col uh, Colorado and our kids were actually old enough to do some of the hiking. Um, and we went to Disney World in the fall and they were enjoying all of it. Um, it's really fun now that they're like a little bit older to do all these fun activities. Um, but COVID happened in 2020 when my kids were really sick. So they had just turned two and four. We had actually just had a joint party for them. Weekend before everything shut down and we were hoping we were super spread over them. Um, and all of a sudden it was like our world turned. So now Luke and I are trying to work at home in our basement uh, office together uh, while also having these two and four year old. And this was just like really stressful and hard. Uh, this is a really hard year. For us. Um, so at first, you know, when everybody was kind of like, nothing was, we weren't working on much, everybody was sitting right? Then I like really stepped into, I'm going to be an amazing mom. 
And so I was like looking up all these mom blogs of activities. And then what I found was there was this clear negative association with the amount of time I put into the activity, but the amount my children enjoyed. <laughs> so, I was like, so I was like trying to come up with all these cool things like muffin volcano things and like cloud dough and blue black and slime. And it was like the mess would be out. The children would stop after two minutes and I would just be like, <laughs> and so I realized that I am I do not have the skill to be a mom. Um, but I very much am grateful that I had this period of time to spend with them. Um, so what we ended up doing is we just like forget it, just go outside, roll in the dirt, like just do something, have fun out there. Um, so we spent we got this cool blow up slide thing in our backyard. Um, we spent a lot of time outside. We would take them out. Luke and I would basically just take turns. Like I would work and he would take the kids, and then he would come in. He would work, and I would take the kids. Uh, and this went on. They did not daycare for six months. Uh, so from March to eight, to August, uh, they were just at home. We were trying to work and be with our kids. Um, and it was a real lesson in, like, you know, trying to be flexible um, and prioritizing health. Um, and also, we just relied so much on our so What kept us going was that we started. So we, looked at your, uh, we started about, like, April time. We were like, we need to see. We started something that we called parking lot pizza. And so we have these families that live really close to us. Um, they're our friends, and they have kids the same age. We would all meet in the parking lot of Burns Park Elementary. We would order dominoes to be delivered. Um, and the parents would bring their drinks, and the kids would get their dominoes. And uh, we just sit out and have fun. Um, and we did that every Friday. Every Friday, families would come together, pizza, we'd have fun. And it just kept it like, so we just, we really needed that connection our best friends and like, now we still to this day do parking lot pizza but we don't go to the parking lot anymore we go to each other's houses and we, every friday we get a standing fun day of, of having fun today so you know there's work and there's life and a lot of people say like how do you have this work life balance and what i've learned is that there's no work life balance and work life balance for everybody what you what your balance is is probably quite different from what my balance is and what my balance is today is different from what it was when my kids were little and where my kids were born and I'm sure it'll be different from when my kids are older um and so work-life balance looks super different for everyone and, and for somebody over time um there's really no such thing there's just decisions and choices that you make and you figure out what are your values and what makes you happy and fulfilled and then you work with them so like I personally like I'm in this time in my life where I want to spend a lot of time kids and so I don't work a lot on weekends or at all um, or at night because I want to be with my kids I want to be present um, and so maybe I'm not as productive as some of my colleagues uh, but this is the balance that is making me feel really good right now and making me feel good and maybe that will change when they're older um, but this is really important to me and how I'm moving forward and I realize that I just have to be like confident in how I feel about how that's fulfilling to me and not compare myself to somebody with my different work life I've also had some amazing mentors here. <laughs> I'll get to that picture in a second. Um, so, so Tom has been a great mentor and colleague. Uh, we we co advised all of our students together. I think we both really work together in that respect. Um, I really appreciated the mentorship of Pinky and also seeing him and Betsy as this dual couple uh, in academia has been really inspiring. Um, and we got to know you a little bit better on the Africa trip. And, we did some um, and I've come to you so much. Um, also, when I first came here, you, uh, Lee, and Doug Schwabel were just the most inviting, inclusive, and wonderful people that made me feel so good immediately. Um, and Mimi was like just such a wonderful friend that when I had kids, she was giving me hand me downs and she was meeting with me and making me feel good about everything. Um, they're at Penn now, and I visited Penn in January and something. Like that. They're just such wonderful people. So grateful that they were here. Um, and then there's Dan Claw, who's actually an anesthesiologist, and he's just always looked out for me since I've been here from engaging with him through uh, the CTSA and the SHAR. Um, he's just really been a wonderful person. He's uh, taking me on a trip to Africa, for example, and a, an awesome safari, but also just taking me really to the um, And then, this is the only time in which Bamar gets to look up at me, <laughs> physically. 
But I I am in awe of and all that you have done to do. And I am so, so grateful to have learned from you much more closely over the last few years. Um, we didn't really know each other when you chose me as a safety chair, and I'm so grateful that you did. And I just, I don't know how you do all that you do. You make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I learn so much from you every day. Every day I learn so much, and I'm just in pain. I just look up to you so much, and I'm so grateful for all that you have, have taught me. And then there's everybody else, and I'm sorry to put you on here. <laughs> you know, who has, has had some, some impact in my life, um, and in work especially. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to have been associate chair for the last few years. Um, with Lou and Mark, we've made this awesome team. We make pictures difficult, but we make it really <laughs> great in the department. Um, and what I've loved is not only getting to know Vermont and you much better, but I really loved, I just felt this like such a deeper connection to the department. Um, it was really, you know, as I became associate chair, I got way more confident in myself and my belonging here and my value here. And I love interacting with the students and I love hearing about what you all want from the department and seeing how we can happen. Um, and I enjoy being a part of all of the activities that we have. Um, and all the things that we've done. <clears throat> and one really great thing about being associate chair is that I have zero pictures with this person, but Nicole. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't find a picture with you, so I took your little pictures. <laughs> but I've gotten to work with Nicole so closely. I'm so, so grateful. You're so amazing. You're so good at your job. And I love working with you. You've become like a friend, and so I'm so grateful to have gotten this position. So I just want to end a little bit with um, selling life as a professor. So <laughs> I don't think that enough students think that this is a good job. And it really is. This is an amazing job. So many of our students want to go to industry. But let me tell you about all the great things as a professor, especially women. So 56% of biostat graduate students are women, but only 41% of biostat professors are women, and half of those are on non tenure campus. So, you know, I came in on a non tenure campus, and I came tenure track. And it's awesome. I love my job. I love what I do. And what's really great about it is it's super flexible. Like, no one is my boss. I am not talking in and out. You know, I get to work when I want to work. And for me, that's like regular hours. But for some people, that might be nighttime or early morning, right? And sometimes I just, like, next Friday, I just told one of my students, like, hey, I'm not, I can't be with you in person because I'm going to go read to my kids' class. Right? So you can just kind of do these things when you want to. Um, what I really, really love about my job is that it's what I'm working on is always changing. It's this abundant variety of projects I work on and people I get to work with and things that I get to learn every day. I get to learn about all these really new cool areas. Um, and that's just so exciting. You know, everything is changing and it's always different. I get to interact with all these great students um, who are inspiring and fun and funny and like, you know, see them succeed. That's super, super great. Um, and, and just really fulfilled. There's job stability. <laughs> so not to be <laughs> undersold. Uh, I have a colleague at Pfizer who has, um, you know, a lot. He, he moved from place to place. He's at Pfizer. He's high up and he's fine. But so much of the staff uh, program was, was cut from Pfizer recently. And every week from December through January, he was on the edge of his seat worried about his job. Um, and you know what? I'm not. I was walking to school, showing up really happy every day. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there's a stability in that, and it's really good. And I'm, I'm just always learning, you know, as someone who has enjoyed school, I just get to be in school for the rest of my life, and I love it. Um, and then the last thing, which I'll touch back on again in a few slides, is travel. Right? I get to travel for my job. I get to go to places for conferences. I get to share what I'm doing with others and travel. And, and the school gets a pay for that. Um, and so that's just, it's really exciting. <laughs> so a little bit about what I do today, right? So you know I do my research, but then when I'm not here, what am I doing? So I really love to bake and cook. So pies, we make a cheesecake every year for Valentine's Day. Here are my soft shells. I'm also really good at crab cakes. Um, those are my Maryland specialties. Um, I, I coached my daughter's uh, second grade basketball team this past fall. If you were in 619, you knew I lost my voice every week because I was screaming at them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was super fun. 
uh, uh, we go on family adventures. We have a really fun time this, this Christmas. We have that extra week. We did all these day adventures to Detroit, to Toledo. We're doing all such fun family things. Um, and then we have this really awesome friend group. So we get together every Friday for parking lot pizza, but we also do fun trips like we all went to Detroit, had a Detroit fun day without the children. Uh, our favorite place to go is uh, Spencer's Eat. Um, so Luke and I have a monthly date, and then we often go with friends as well. Um, and if I'm not there, I'm in our garage gym. So I still like to be active. I don't play basketball anymore. Um, but I like to be active. So we have a bike, a tread, a row, um, and weights in an area, a big TV in our garage. And we have it like a garage gym. I work out there every morning. Um, and we have a Peloton. So I became a huge fan of Peloton. And this is me fangirling in the London studios <laughs> at, a, at a live Peloton class, <laughs> uh, in the summer. It was super exciting. Um, so, so those are sort of my interests in what I do on the day to day. <clears throat> so, my near future goals um, will be to continue this great research with students uh, in rare disease and patients in trials. Um, I feel like I really been more confident in myself. I was always trying to prove myself that I belonged, that I could do this. Um, and now I'm like, I did it. I'm here. Um, and so I'm really trying to live in that and just be confident in that and act my values. Um, I'm trying to be more present as a mom, a friend, a mentor. Um, you know, not always stuck in my phone or not always stuck on a checklist, but really to actually enjoy what I'm doing. Um, and I really hope that people need by uh, to be a good role so mostly for my kids, but I also hope that I'm not all for students, my students, and other students in the world, um, and for junior faculty. So I really do hope that I'm meeting my friends. But really, my super year future goals are travel. I've been telling everybody since I became full professor that I'm living my YOLO full professor life. Um, and everyone in 619 knows that I don't say that much because <laughs> so I was living my life. Um, so uh, I've been on just some amazing uh, travel trips with Luke and family. Um, and we have some really exciting travel lined up. So in May, we're going to Cyprus. In July, we're going to Venice. And then we're going on sabbatical next winter in Australia. Um, and so I'm super excited for these trips. To you know, both work, but also with. So a few of my life lessons as my not quite forty year old uh, <laughs> journey, the lecture comes to an end. Not my journey, um, right? So like as I've tried to prove myself throughout, uh, you know, I realize that I can, and I don't have to prove to prove it. Sometimes I can just say to have a hard time saying. Uh, but I've really tried to figure out my about. Been doing that, I feel like a lot more authentically uh, recently. I, I also feel like you have to find the things that make you happy. So, right, I wasn't really happy originally here, but I figured out what made me happy, and then luckily that was not. So, that's what made it worth it to work. That's what I was doing, and I kept going. Um, but if the same thing happens in grad school, right? you're not just doing it to do it, you got to figure out what makes you happy. Um, I personally thrive in routine. If you ask me about my day, every day, it's basically the same <laughs> because I like that. Um, but I realize that it's really important to be flexible. Um, and we learn that in I'm still learning how to do this. Uh, but really to surround yourself with your And I felt so, so grateful to have that both in my personal life, um, but also in And it's even better. <clears throat> so um, I still hope that I have a, a bright future ahead of me. <laughs> um, and <laughs> but what's really exciting is I know that like all of these students have such a bright future, and it's just really awesome. So thank you so much for you know for coming here, for being a part of Michigan, coming to my Jimmy lecture for um, to talk about myself for the last few. Few, you know, few hours, and I really just can't wait to see what happens to you. Thank you so much.